Um, so thank you for everyone for organizing this wonderful event. It's been great to hear about the research so far. Um, we're excited to keep going with the theme of integrating health and technology across the globe. And today Masaki and I will talk about our experiences with Engineers Without Borders and how we work towards creating these sustainable solutions. So before I begin, I just want to give a little bit of background. Um, Engineers Without Borders, EWB, is a national organization and is an umbrella organization for all university projects such as the one at Tufts. So EWB USA was first established in 2000. It really helps us here at Tufts with our organization of assessment, implementation, and monitoring trips. And Masaki will go a little bit more in depth about what those entail. They also help us with um, technical reviews and assessments that happen before we go on each and every trip. Here at Tufts, we are a combination of liberal arts and engineering students, as Professor Goot so kindly said. We have had projects since 2004, and our focus is really on the design and implementation of these projects. We, have, we pride ourselves in having this vast array of students and really pride ourselves on the interdisciplinary research that we can do. We have had past projects in Tibet and Ecuador, and we're currently focusing in El Salvador and Uganda. So Masaki will talk a little bit more about how we work and the process of our projects. Hello. Um, so as Aaron previously described, um, EW National provides us with basic guidelines of how each of these projects should be carried out. So this diagram up here is a basic representation of the different project phases. So of course, um, any project has to have a start somehow. And in a couple of minutes, I'll be talking in greater detail about the different options and our experiences with starting the project. But basically, when we start a project, um, we work with Engin Engineers Without Borders National, and we sign a, at least a minimum of five-year commitment with our partnering communities. And what we do is we take the project into our first um, assessment phase where we connect with the community, define a project we're gonna work on, and do a little bit of background research. And that leads into our next stage, which is the implementation, which is the um, engineering heavy portion of our project where we come up with a solution, work with the community, and implement it. And once we're done with that, phase, we carry on to a monitoring phase where we're basically assessing either the success of the project or the failures and really looking into what contributed to those successes, failures, and determining whether we are going to carry on with this project or we're going to make some modifications or perhaps is ready to be closed. Um, so today, Aaron and I are going to be presenting to you about our specific experiences with these different um, project phases and how really, as a chapter, we have developed our unique approach to um, international development projects and implementing sustainable solutions for some of these most pressing needs. So just as I said before, um, a project has to be begun somehow. So with Engineers Without Borders, there are two distinct ways in which you could start a project. Um, EWB National is in contact with thousands of NGOs around the globe, and sometimes those NGOs specifically contact um, EWB National with a community or a project in mind. So they have a database of different possible projects, and each student chapter has the opportunity to look into them to see if they would like to adopt a project. Um, another way of starting a project is by proposing one. Um, and Tufts actually has done this several times, and often it is through personal connections or just prior experiences that Tufts students have had um, before coming to Tufts or while they're here at Tufts. So two quick case studies that I will present to you right now is um, our first project that started our Tufts EWB chapter back in 2005 um, was the Tibet project. Uh, basically, our founder of the Tufts EWB chapter traveled to Colorado to meet with representatives at the EWB headquarters and not only found the chapter, but also start our first project. So this is an example of how we adopted uh, EWB National Project. And this, those pictures up above on your right are the pictures of what they implemented. Um, the focus of the project was hygiene, and uh, they addressed that by um, developing latrines. So our most recent program um, was developed through personal um, connections, as I described before. A student here, Scott MacArthur, who just recently graduated last year, took a freshman seminar course in 
that was focused on Engineers Without Borders, and his experience in the classroom inspired him to start an EWB project. So in the summer of 2009, when he traveled to Uganda with his church, um, he connected with an NGO and he struck up a conversation with the director of the NGO to start this project. So from then on, we developed a relationship with an NGO in eastern Uganda and started working with a village called Shilongo. So once a project has been established, the next phase is the assessment. And what I'll reiterate over the course of this slide is that we really feel that it's important to work with a community, not for a community. So in this phase, we're really starting our partnership between the community and Tufts EWB. So the first phase is really to decide or to help the community brainstorm ideas of what they see as their most pressing needs. We don't want to come into a community and say, we as tough students think you need X, Y, and Z. We really value their opinion and really feel that it's their ideas are more important than the technology that we can bring to them. So this is absolutely one of the most crucial parts of the process. We really talk to the community to figure out what types of projects interest their interest them. So for example, we've had a few communities that say we really want a new hospital, we really want a new school. And that leads me into the next point of what is going to be the best match. As student engineers, that is way beyond the scope of our talents to say that we can promise them a new hospital or a new school. So we try and focus them on projects that will be um, geared toward the university that we can really help them with. Um, the past few projects have really focused around water sanitation. Also, a crucial part of this process is the start of a par partnership between our non-governmental organizations and here at Tufts Chapter. The NGOs really help facilitate this beginning process. They help us not only overcome any language barriers that might be present, but also help us figure out a new and completely foreign country. They oftentimes have access to internet and are really key in communication and establishing this partnership. One of EWB Nationals, um, uh, parts of this process is establishing a memorandum of understanding and this is something that the Tufts EWB chapter really enjoys and really feels is very important. This memorandum of understanding is a document that again we work with the community to establish and really helps decide what roles each party is going to play. For example in this memorandum we would outline what the Tufts chapter would do for each project but also what we expect the community to bring forth. This is really important as we want to make sure there's a balance, sort of a give and take of this partnership between EWB and the community. So I'd like to highlight this with an example from our El Salvador project. The El Salvador group started in Arada Vieja and they were focusing again on water. In Arada Vieja in 2006, the community was very cohesive, um, very in tune with each other and really helped the um, Tufts EWB group design a project and go forth with the project. After a successful um, assessment, implementation, and monitoring, as Masaki described, the Tufts EWB students decided that after this success, it was time to close the project, and that went well. They then transitioned to a nearby community called Poor Veneer. They went in with the same ideas, the same understanding that there would be a close-knit community, and sort of based their strategy on that. However, um, the, poor, the community members in Port Veneer did not own their own land. And this resulted in a little bit less cohesive community. Um, it was a little bit harder to, the, to establish the structure of community. And the Tufts EWB chapter really had to think about different strategies to work with this different community. We ended up working with um, the mayor and having a high effectiveness of working with women's meetings to um, find out information. So this is a key example of how in the assessment phase, it's absolutely crucial to know your community and understand the community. We can't assume that each community will have the same set of strengths and every community is absolutely different. Okay, so once you return from your assessment phase or the assessment trip, you have all this information that you have gathered, the different ideas um, that the community has brought forth. So we come back on campus and gather together as a group or um, an organization of about 60 students and split like 30-30 between the two projects, um, El Salvador and Uganda. And here, 
we really work on the design aspect. So that's um, doing calculations, coming up with design drawings, like the one shown above there of the Uganda project, um, testing out prototypes, and doing estimation of material costs and figuring out where exactly we're going to get these materials. Um, and along with that, we realized that in order to implement a sustainable project, that there has to be an education component to it. There has to be um, an equal understanding, an equal knowledge of what's going on technically, how do you fix it, um, and also understand why exactly are we doing this, the details of why is one water source cleaner than the other, and how did we determine that. So one good example of what we've done to share this knowledge is a water manual that one of the students um, who was heavily involved in the Uganda group developed. Basically, this water manual went through basic hygiene and diseases and um, all water-related issues, but what was special and unique about this water manual was that it was specific to the village and very, very specific to eastern Uganda and what um, the different issues that are prevalent in that area. Um, so this phase is extremely busy for us. We are back at Tufts and we're also students, so we don't have that much time. And there are also a lot of things that we handle on our plate. Um, of course, because we're engineers that borders, we're doing the designs, but also in order to make this project happen, we have to look for funding sources. So we're um, always applying for grants and we're always also interacting with our partners on the campus, such as the Institute of Global Leadership and the Tisch College, and keeping them up to speed and asking them for suggestions and feedback and partnership in that regard. Um, and of course, the most important part is really engaging with our partner communities and the NGOs while we're, while we're still overseas. So it is very difficult with the distance and the time difference, but we make um, a lot of effort through phone calls, emails, snail mail, anything we can do um, to keep in touch with them. So of course, once we have um, adequately prepared for an implementation, we get the opportunity to travel there and actually make this idea happen to um, construct our design. So this part of the project really requires a lot of flexibility on our part as well as our partners as plans are always changing. So while we're here at Tufts and making the design plans and coming up with the drawings and doing the calculations, we're doing this based off of the knowledge that we have gained um, overseas and have researched about the material availability. However, of course, whenever we go on ground, everything's not as planned. Either the material that we had previously found to be available is not available for those specific periods of time, or the properties of the mud bricks that they make aren't exactly what we had anticipated. So this is where really the engineers get to experience the real life um, challenges of having to think on their feet, really make on-the-spot decisions and do recalculations as you're pouring concrete um, to the left and really interacting with the community. And um, another part that really changes or that requires flexibility is a community. So while we're talking to them, of course, since we would like this to be a community-driven project, they get to put, um, we would like them to put some community input and feedback, even if it's while we're um, drilling or constructing. So oftentimes our, chain, our plans change while we're already on the go or while we're already putting, laying the bricks down. Um, so that, with that part of the project, we really have to be flexible. Um, and that's something that we really stress within our community to take ownership of the project, not just listen to us and say, yes, 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 that sounds good, um, but to bring up any concerns that they have and really address them and let us know if there are any um, concerns that we had not previously known before. And that really brings me into the different challenges that we have. So. While we're abroad, we of course have the challenge of the time that we have over there and also the resources that we have in terms of people. So because tickets um, are very expensive, we can't fund for all of our organization to travel. So usually it's all a very small group of students traveling with a mentor. So that really requires our organization to have very effective leadership skills and management skills to make um, as much of the experience or the time that we have there and make the maximum impact. Um, and of course, as we heard before from Translations Without Borders, language is a huge barrier. So for the El Salvador group, it's not as um, 
difficult because they get they select students who have a working knowledge of Spanish so they can communicate with the um, with the village that they work with however for the Uganda group in particular it's a little challenging because you cannot find students who are fluent in the language of Lugisu um, so what that requires us really to do is integrate ourselves into the community and try to find translators that will work with us and really make sure that there's nothing lost in translation um, and even if you have the perfect translators and the perfect team, what really drives these efforts is the comfort level between our organization and our students and the communities. So of course, coming, out, coming into the community as outsiders, um, it takes a little time for them to really trust us to open up. And in the beginning, particularly the Uganda group, had some issues with um, the channel of communication. So we were basically hearing all these positive feedback from um, the community, but they were a little afraid to tell us the negative um, comments that they have or just concerns that they have just simply because they were afraid that if they said anything negative at all that we would get discouraged and leave. Um, so. Great. So once we come back from this wonderful trip, we have four or five very excited students who have just done these amazing things and, and seen this wonderful new country. So our challenge is really how do we get the rest of the group involved? So. As we are looking through this, we need to figure out where to go next and what to do. This is often our most ambiguous part of the project. We really need to assess if we're going forward, if we're moving back, and what's happening. So as I was beginning to say, one of the beginning challenges is getting other EW members involved. Through Skype, we've had a few members stay up till two or three in the morning at our time to try and call um, individual members of the community. Like we heard in earlier discussions, there's a huge increase in cell phone usage, especially in Africa, and that has really worked to our benefit because we're able to talk to community members. It's through here that we begin to, to um, plan for our monitoring trip. We really rely heavily on community feedback to see what's going on with the community if our designs are working and really what we do need to do to go forward. So this brings us to our monitoring phase. Um, EWB National has a few set of requirements that we really follow. They decide or they suggest that every time you open a new project, if it's within the same country as an original project, you still monitor that original product. So as I was saying earlier, the El Salvador group has worked in Arada Vieja and Por Venir. Even though Arada Vieja is technically a closed project, we still go back and monitor that as frequently as possible when we are still working in Por Venir. So this is incredibly important to us. We really like to continue the relationship that we've established to the community and still want to be sure that our designs are um, working the way they should even many years after they are implemented. In this phase, as I have stressed many times, community feedback is incredibly crucial. It is during these trips that we need to decide if we will move forward and perhaps close the project or if we need to return and redesign any previous aspects of this. So I really want to highlight um, an example that happened a few years ago in our Uganda group. As I said, we had a very successful implementation trip, and as Masaki touched upon, our relationship was beginning to grow with the community. And they were so excited to have us there that they kept saying, yes, 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 everything is great, we love what you're doing. Um, it was either the second to last or very last day that we actually found out that this um, bicycle-driven pump that was on a slide earlier that had been a huge success so far, there was actually a cultural taboo around the bike, and that was that females were not allowed to sit on any surface that their father-in-laws could potentially sit in. So since water was primarily collected by women and children, this was a huge concern since women actually did not want to sit on the bike that potentially their father-in-law could sit on. So we left um, because our time was up and we actually returned. And during the communication that we've so heavily stressed with our community, we found out that they were no longer using the bike the way they and we had actually intended. So this really allowed us to say, how did we get to this situation? What happened? And we decided that we needed to take a trip down 
and we realized our lack of communication in the assessment phase, and this allowed us to reevaluate and we're actually preparing for another implementation trip. Okay, so here we return to the original diagram that I started the presentation with. And as you can see, it's a little busier on the screen than it was previously. Um, and that's because as we go through these different projects um, and encounter these different challenges, our students um, learn a lot from these uh, issues. And we really have developed our own unique approach at Tufts of how we approach these development issues and how we implement these sustainable solutions. So noted, um, on the process flow diagram up here are some key points our, that our group focuses on. And overall, as we have stressed over and over again, um, we learned the significance of really taking the time to get to know our community and get to know their issues that are um, that are beyond what is re directly related to a project. So for example, we really realized with the bicycle example that Aaron just presented that we couldn't just focus on what the water issues are and what's dirty and what's clean, we really have to take a step back and understand their daily lives, their daily challenges, and um, what's involved with that. So um, some of the way we achieve this like, great depth of understanding and uh, move forward is trying to integrate our, ourselves into the community as much as possible. So during our trips, um, we have begun to spend a lot more time with the community just to develop our relationship and strengthen it. So for example, um, the trip that I just returned from in January in Uganda, for the first time we did some homestays. Instead of um, staying in a hotel or a hostel, we actually stayed in um, the village members' houses and cooked dinner with them and took bucket showers and went to the water, the, the well, to get our own water. Um, and for the first time also, we used translators within the village who are comfortable with everyone that we're interacting with. And we saw that that made a huge difference and it opened up a great channel of communication that we hadn't seen before. Um, and another way really is, again, to continue our conversations with our partner communities regardless of where we are. So we do Skype calls, we email them, and just it's not always about the project necessarily, but just to check in, to say hello, to let them know that we're sincerely um, committed to this project and developing a relationship, not just to go for a couple weeks at a time, um, once or twice a year, hang out with them, and then leave. We're really interested in developing a sustainable relationship and project and are sincerely concerned about the issues that they address. Great, so since Professor Gu is kindly reminding us that we're almost out of time, I'm just gonna breeze through this slide. And really, as you've heard us emphasize, we have found out that the more years we're there, the more established the relationship is, the more success we have in these implementation trips. Um, this has increased the community-based participatory research. We really stress that we want the community to bring these ideas forward to us instead of us suggesting ideas to them. This has really influenced our group back here at Tufts as we stress in our group leadership and travel team selection. We really try to have um, varied levels of years and ages so that there is the possibility for students to go back multiple times and really um, increase the continuity of our relationships. And with that, we would like to say thank you and we're out of time, so I don't think we have time for questions. <laughs>